Hello, welcome to some video notes. Today we're looking at D.1. The second part of D.1 where we'll be talking about uh, specific illnesses and uh, problems you may be having with your body if you're not getting the appropriate amounts of certain types of nutrition. All right, so we'll be thinking about what happens when certain types of amino acid deficiencies occur or lipid deficiencies occur, uh, having too much or too little fats. If you're having too much or too little um, blood glucose, what does that do to your body? And so we'll be talking just about those specific types of diseases based on your nutrition. So the first thing we'll be talking about is our conditional essential amino acids. So if you remember back in the earlier part of topic D.1, we talked about essential versus non-essential um, nutrition. And so essential vitamins and essential um, amino acids and, and lipids and things like that means that, that you need to have them in your diet. They're essential that you consume them because your body cannot produce them or get them in, in some other form. Um, in order for them to exist to keep you healthy. Where the non-essential ones would be that you, you don't necessarily need to have them in your diet because if you have enough of other forms, then the body can manufacture those amino acids or those specific vitamins uh, when they are necessary. And so it's good that they're in your diet, but they're not necessarily essential for your survival. So conditional essential amino acids is where because of some long due uh, or some long term stress on the body, possibly a long illness, trauma, some type of uh, surgery, for example, a deep infected wound would be another example, where you're going to have a lot of tissue repair, maybe a lot of um, fighting off a specific infection. Your non essential amino acids could can become conditionally essential. So they move into that category of becoming essential for the remainder of that state that the body is in. And this basically comes from this idea that the body isn't able to produce them fast enough at the, at the need that they uh, are, at the current need or the current demand that your body is putting uh, on them, on it. So uh, you're going to have to start consuming them in your diet. And so they get moved over from one category to another. So example here would be like uh, arginine, glutamine, and cysteine which are cysteine, if you want to say it that way, are conditional essential amino acids uh, that are combined to make other uh, nutrients and supplements formulated for wound healing. So if you're going through a recovery because you've you know, damaged yourself, uh, maybe lacerated yourself, or cut your skin quite deep, or maybe you broke an arm, uh, some deep tissue damage in that instance, and also healing the bone, uh, you're going to need to up your intake of these um, non-essential amino acids because they have just become conditionally essential in order to help you heal uh, properly. So when we think about these non-essential amino acids and, and how they can be non-essential, uh, we're talking about them being produced basically using some other types of enzymes. So if we took existing amino acids in the diet and we can convert them into a different amino acid, then that new amino acid that we're creating can be non-essential because we're able to manufacture it. So they give you an example here of phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is essential. You have to consume it but it can be converted through phenylalanine hydroxylase where a hydroxyl will be added on to the phenylalanine right and by doing this it creates tyrosine and so tyrosine really isn't essential even though you can have it in your diet because you can always make more tyrosine if needed because you can take surplus of phenylalanine which is essential and so it would already be present in a good amount in your diet uh, and then convert it and so uh, both phenylalanine and tyrosine can be used uh, by cells, but tyrosine specifically is going to be used for building specific proteins and signals uh, in cells or used for cell signaling. And so the regulation of this movement from non-essential to uh, an essential, sorry, to a non-essential uh, amino acid is all going to be based on demand inside of those cells. Uh, how many of these phenylalanine hydro hydroxylases have been produced, so how much of those enzymes are present. And those uh, high quantity of enzymes uh, increase the output of tyrosine, and so uh, it's there to meet the demand for if there, there's some type of injury in the body, then we would have more tyrosine end up getting produced in order to meet the demand put on by the whatever damage has happened.
So the first uh, disease that we're going to start to talk about is this idea of what happens when uh, you in generally are not getting enough protein or your essential proteins and enough uh, amino acids. So this would mean that you're having a protein deficiency or malnutrition. And so this is actually a major issue when dealing with hunger uh, or third world countries that are going through um, famines or not having enough uh, agro agro agricultural production in order to meet the demands of their, the hunger needs of their population. So they might have enough food to survive, right? They have enough nutrition necessary to keep alive, but they're not getting enough of these essential amino acids to grow properly. And so if you don't have enough essential amino acids, your non-essential amino acids are also not going to be meeting these certain levels that are necessary to grow properly. And so some of those non-essential amino acids get put into the essential category as conditional essential amino acids. And so you're even being, your, your deficiency of those essential amino acids is going to be doubly worse in some ways because the essential ones are not being meat and then more of the non-essential are then being converted to essential, which is also having a more strain on your body. So when you don't have enough protein intake, uh, you don't have enough um, amino acid intake, your protein levels are quite low. That's gonna have a huge impact on so many different things in your body because Proteins, right, do so many different functions, right? You're physically going to be smaller and weaker because your muscles are built from proteins. Your connective tissue is going to be built from lots of different proteins. You're not going to be as metabolically active. Uh, you're not going to be able to digest things as well because you're not producing enough enzymes necessarily for your digestive system because you don't have enough protein in your diet. So even if you were given a good amount of food for a meal, there's a chance that you wouldn't digest it appropriately and it would actually make you quite sick because you don't actually have enough of the proper enzymes to do a proper digestion of a meal like that. So even when food is taken to places where we have famine like this, you can't just give the food to the individuals, you need to give it to them in small appropriate doses so that they can slowly build back up their um, digestive system to where it needs to be so that they can actually handle the, the rich food full of uh, you know fats and, and proteins um, in order to help them along. Uh, obviously, you're going to have a lot of problems with anti -production, antibody production and your immune system because that's all built on um, and your antibodies, which are made out of amino acids, are all proteins as well. So cell growth and repair, um, your whole body, your tissue growth and the conditions of your organs are all going to kind of be deficient and your immunity is going to be worse. And then another interesting feature, if you look at the, the child here that is suffering from this condition, you see that they're basically skin and bones in all parts of their body, except they've got this relatively large protruding stomach, right? And that you would think like, oh, it looks like a big full belly. They must have just had a lot of food or something. And so that's what happens when you're skinny, you eat a big meal. But actually that is a, that is a, a semi-permanent condition because of them being protein deficient, because they're starving. Because what they have there is actually edema. And edema, is when your your fluid starts to um, gather specifically in your abdomen region because it's not really able to efficiently re re get out of the, that tissue area and get back into the blood efficiently. And so you kind of get this swelling and, and this pain around your abdominal cavity as it kind of gets full of the tissue fluid uh, because of osmotic regulation, you're, you're not having enough of the concentration of certain amino acids and proteins in your blood, so then water starts moving into your tissue rather than moving into your blood. Remember, water tends to move from high concentration to a low concentration, right? If you don't have enough solutes uh, dissolved into your blood, your blood starts to becoming the very high concentration of water. So rather than the water staying necessarily in your blood more often, it's going to move from your blood into your tissue fluid, which because it doesn't have enough dissolved amino acids, enough proteins um, inside of those cells, uh, the concentration of water being quite low um, and also the water, water being an issue as well in, in most of these areas. So the uh, tissue fluid ends up uh, kind of absorbing a lot of this excess bodily fluid and that creates swelling in the abdomen, uh, which can, can be misleading in terms of their overall health and also can be quite painful. So uh, the risk factors that are contributing to conditions like this, obviously extreme poverty, overpopulation, and large family sizes takes the limited resources that might already exist and stretch them in even thinner. And then the idea of droughts and poor infrastructure for transporting food around 
uh, the country, war, of course, having a major impact on where resources are going to be sent and whether or not resources can safely be transported from one place to another. Uh, these are all going to be things that could affect and lead to, or, or could be leading causes that are uh, le um, promoting this type of condition in the world. And just to give you an idea of the different forms of what would be healthy versus unhealthy. So you just saw a really good example of something that was malnutrition, all right, or undernutrition, right? Or sorry, um, undernutrition. Malnutrition in general means that your mal means bad and nutrition is nutrition. So basically bad nutrition, but there's different types of bad nutrition. We all in life and ecosystems and cells and in organisms like you, moderation or balance is necessary, right? Homeostasis is the key. So you could also be over neutralized or nutrition nutritionized, I guess you could say it, or having over nutrition. So that's basically when a person is eating too much, mostly of the wrong things. And so they have accumulation of other bad health effects because of that accum of the excessive amounts of fats and sugars, uh, which normally uh, start to collect in the body in fat tissue and then can lead to more strain on the organs and we'll talk about that in just a minute but you guys probably a little bit for you can imagine in your head someone who is obese that is having issues with their uh, maintaining a regular body weight they might be over uh, doing it with the new sorry they might be overdoing it with the nutrition and then the example we just went through, that would be someone that would be under nutrition. So someone not getting enough nutrition or is lacking one specific nutrient that is necessary, like essential amino, amino acids not necessarily getting in there, essential vitamins not being part of their diet. And so even though you might have enough energy to survive, if you're not getting all of the nutrition that is necessary to be healthy, you'd be uh, having under nutrition. Now, if the process of being under nutriated or not having enough nutrition uh, were to continue on long enough, eventually a person could enter what we would call starvation. And that's when the nutrient uptake um, or intake drops below what is needed to maintain their initial body mass and their body actually begins to consume itself. So uh, cells constantly want to be alive. So non-efficient use of proteins of fats of um, carbohydrates in the body will start to degrade to keep the more important parts of the body functioning so you need your lungs functioning you need your heart and your circulatory system functioning you need your brain to function right so if those those three things are going to be maintained as best as they can where all the other parts of your body will start to wither away. So your bones will get more brittle. Your muscles will start to degrade to the point where you might not even be able to stand. You could even go blind as parts of your eyes and your ocular um, system are removed or digested by itself in order to keep your by your body in order to keep you alive. So we took a relatively healthy person and they are entering this point of starvation, they might actually die of starvation until maybe about two months after they've hit that point because there's still a lot of energy, a lot of nutrition inside of your body and your body is going to start e basically consuming itself, using that as a source of nutrition until eventually you're, you can't maintain uh, all those important systems, your circulatory nervous system and um, uh, your respiratory system anymore and ultimately the your body shuts off or different organ systems fail and ultimately ending up uh, with death. So typically someone straight displaying starvation like we would saw in that earlier image um, we're going to see in general their non-essential body systems may be starting not to function very very well uh, when starting to degrade uh, trying to keep the other ones um, uh, functioning better. Here, let me give you an, an image of what we're referring to. So here we've got two uh, different versions of this female. We have one that has probably a fairly healthy diet versus one that has gone through the period of starvation. And we see with the starvation, the frame of the individual is reduced. All right, there are basically skin and bones because essentially the, the bones and muscle tissue that make up your skeletal muscles is not essential. You need to keep your heart functioning and your lungs and your brain functioning. So they will start to be eroded as um, away as much as possible. If we look at their actual heart though, we look at the normal heart versus one that's going to lead towards heart failure because of starvation. The amount of muscular tissue in the heart has been reduced. If you look at this region here, the ventricles, muscle layers are much smaller uh, or have been reduced concerned to compared to the ventricle muscles that are present in a normal healthy heart <coughs> and so 
even though we're trying to keep the heart functioning as well as possible, the um, strength of the heart is going to be reduced because it itself is also going to have its, some of its muscle tissue reduced uh, in order to try to you know, keep enough nutrients in the body to keep all these systems alive. Now, that's what's going to happen if you are purposely or in, because of environmental conditions not getting enough nutrition and you enter that starvation mode. But you could also be overnutriated or having too much nutrition and that could also cause some other problems, health problems as well. Remember, balance is what's key. So when we think about how do you become um, overnutriated, so basically you're eating beyond what is necessary. And so really what you should be doing is eating until you're no longer hungry but really hunger is kind of a vague concept so like what does that mean like when you're when you're no hunger no longer hungry because some some of you might sit at home and you eat a, a large meal and then in 20 minutes you feel like you could probably eat again so it's it's should you be eating again like this this feeling of hunger so let's talk about where it comes from and what actually controls your appetite so appetite is is the desire to eat food, right? And we could also say it as a feeling, it is hunger, right? So your appetite is your body's telling you that you need nutrition, and then hunger is the feeling that is produced by the regulation of your appetite telling you that it is time to eat. And so your hunger is maintained by hormones, a lot of different multiple system concepts like you know happiness and sadness and excited and scared all right hunger or thirst they are normally multiple systems and different organs working together uh, to regulate this type of process so hormones are going to be responsible for these different cells and organs being able to communicate with each other and so the hormones um, that help you feel hunger and also help you feel full are going to be produced by fat cells and the hypothalamus. So adipose tissue, which is the, the word for fat cells, right? fat cells is the common term, uh, and then hypothalamus, which is a region of the brain, more towards the center of your brain, which is kind of the connecting point between your nervous system and your endocrine system, which is your hormones are. So your nervous system, you know, sends information all around your body for some control and the endocrine system sends hormones all over your body in order to help with control. So it's kind of this meeting point between these two different systems. So there are different hormones that you should be aware of that are going to take part in this process. So for example, we have leptin. So leptin is an appetite repressor. And so what happens is adipose tissues can release leptin and then it will move through the blood up to the central nervous system sensors or sensors in the hypothalamus. And then it causes the hypothalamus to um, downgrade the concept of being hunger so to a kind of a negative feedback system in terms of the concept of hunger and so this comes from this idea that um, uh, you take in a bunch of food so kind of diagramming it down here so come on so we take in a bunch of food so we eat a bunch of food right and so because of that we uh, we digest it we absorb it and it gets stored in our adipose tissue so our adipose tissue is going to then start uh, releasing a bunch of leptin uh, as they are increasing in number and increasing in volume all right and their size that ends up traveling up to the hypothalamus which triggers the hypothalamus that hey you can increase the metabolic rate because we've got more energy than we probably need right we've got enough energy so if there's like a bunch of growth you need to do uh, in different parts of the body have that growth go off if the body's a little cold and we need to up our uh, core temperature and start you know burning some more energy in different parts of our body like our muscles go ahead you know increase the metabolism rate but then also you we need to decrease the intake because we have more energy than we need we're starting to store it in our, our tissues for long term as the form of fat so we don't really need to be worrying about eating anymore and so uh, energy uptake decreases metabolic rate increases and to a certain extent uh, there will be some weight loss so this this fat cells or these fat cells that were being produced from you know the meal that you had uh, earlier in the day or earlier in the week uh, will start to degrade because you're you're being used as a source of energy and so we kind of have this continuous cycle here and so as the adipose tissue starts to leave uh, then we can see an increase in hunger and then you start eating Right, and then the fat tissue comes back and the leptin le levels increase. And so it's kind of uh, um, a system here, this, so the self regulating or negative feedback system. Okay, we have uh, cherylin or gerilin, sorry, which is an appetite, increases the appetite, which comes from the stomach, activating the central nervous system. And so this would be, for example, when you're eating and you physically put food into your stomach, you actually start to stretch. The muscles of your stomach because normally your stomach is relatively deflated 
because right? it doesn't need to take up a bunch of space inside of your body and feel heavy. But when you start putting food in there, when you start eating, it starts expanding and getting ready to do the digestion uh, process. And so as this expansion occurs, it can signify to the central nervous system, like, oh, it's eating time. Like we have food, so uh, let's let's promote eating. All right, let's increase appetite so that we we eat this food as much as as we can get because you know we don't know when we're going to come across this food again. We also have some melanocyte stimulating hormones which can decrease appetite. This is where the hypothalamus would be sending it out to many different targets like different neurons and different tissues, right? So when the appetite starts to decrease, right? Like leptin comes in, activates the hypothalamus. This hormone could be released by the hypothalamus to tell other parts of the body, okay, increase your metabolic rate and decrease uh, your hunger and your energy intake. Uh, we have insulin, which normally decreases your appetite. Insulin is used to help regulate your blood sugar level. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit. And so when your blood sugar levels are really high, insulin needs to help you lower your blood sugar levels by helping you absorb the glucose from your blood into your muscle cells and into your liver cells and into cells like adipose tissue that can store it as energy uh, and a stored form of energy so it would therefore decrease your appetite right because you already have more than enough energy in your blood it's floating around affecting the amount of solutes in your blood affecting how much water is in your blood so we don't want to add more to it so it will decrease your appetite where uh, thyroid hormone might increase your appetite because the thyroid hormones, thyroids regulate your energy intake and your metabolic activity. So if you've burnt through a whole bunch of, if you've increased your metabolic activity, because uh, maybe you're going to go through a growth spurt, for example, the thyroid would be signaling that you need to eat more because we're going to go through a bunch of metabolic activity and you're going to need energy to power that long-term metabolic activity. So that would affect the appetite in that way. So there's lots of different ones uh, that, you're, that we could look at that affect appetite. It's not just one thing, one um, protein and one hormone that's going to be regulating all this stuff. Ones that you're going to see that are, are important, you should be, definitely take a note of, is how leptin works. Uh, and how insulin works. And we're going to talk more about insulin in, in the next few slides. So obviously, if your appetite isn't necessarily being uh, regulated, if you are overeating, that can lead to a lot of different bodily problems. Increased adipose tissue, increased fat cells, and puts more weight on your body, puts more weight on the individual organs that are surrounded by fat tissue. Normally, fat tissue is stored around your organs in order to help protect them, you know, from bumping into each other very much, and then also helps insulate them, helps them, you know, you know, keep their your body temperature at the right, right range, and so the fat acts like an insulator. So if you add a bunch of fat, uh, you might have a difficulty regulating your body temperature because you just kind of put on, you put on an insulator that's inside of your body, so you might overheat easier because uh, you've got this extra fat tissue around your organs. Uh, and your organs in your body will physically feel heavier. And so this can cause a certain different, different amounts of con uh, various conditions. But one condition that it can lead to is what we call hypertension or an abnormally high blood pressure. And this comes from the fact that your body is heavier. Uh, movement of your body uh, or this idea of momentum of your body requires more energy to move something that is larger in size. So your muscles are going to strain a little bit more just doing regular activities like walking. And then if you don't exercise very much, uh, doing a bunch of running or a bunch of exercise might be even more strenuous with the extra weight that's been attached to you. So then your heart is going to um, have to pump harder to deliver the nutrients and the oxygen uh, to those muscle cells to keep you in motion. And so, you know, if you're really overweight, if you're obese, just moving around can be strenuous um, in um, just going on a regular walk could be very strenuous because you're just walking around with all this extra weight. They're using muscles that maybe are not getting as um, enough nutrients, enough oxygen because of uh, maybe lower blood pressure. So your heart starts pumping harder. Uh, and so eventually you start getting this maintained, consistent high blood pressure caused by hormones being released from your body saying we need more oxygen and we need more nutrients. Um, it's very difficult to, to move these muscles. And so if you have a condition of 
hypertension. It, if you are a systolic and diastolic pressure, and we'll talk about the cardiac system, we'll talk more about what this means, but it's basically the pressure of when your heart is um, contracting versus the heart when you're, the pressure when your heart is relaxing. And so if your systolic pressure is above 140 and your diastolic pressure is above 90, uh, and that's millimeters from mercury, it's the units that they use for blood pressure. And it's the only place really in medical science they seem to use millimeters of mercury. Um, but it's the units. Um, but if your blood pressure is very high uh, in both conditions, we would say that you have hypertension. And so this would come from uh, increasing weights, more pressure on the blood to move around the body. Abdominal areas weigh, uh, can have more fat, which is more likely to cause problems with the arteries thickening up or arthrosclerosis, which we'll talk about more in another topic. So as um, fat builds up in the inside of the arteries, that can make it difficult for blood to move through them because it's physically getting in the way, it's blocking the movement of the blood in some ways. So that's gonna create even more pressure, all right? Because you're trying to push this blood through a narrow opening and then if we cut the size of that opening in half, then all that blood has to move through that narrow opening still. So it's gonna be more pressure as it passes through the opening. So uh, both of these would be contributing to more blood pressure, which results in your, your hypertension. Another issue that could come from being overnutriated and having too much nutrition in addition to hypertension and poor appetite control would be uh, getting diabetes. And so diabetes mellitus, mellitus uh, is there's different types depending on uh, where the condition comes from, exactly what's causing the condition. But in both instances, it has something to do with the insulin. The insulin is, is either doesn't exist or the insulin is not being made in the proper form or the right concentration. And so the body cannot really regulate the amount of um, glucose or, uh, or the blood sugar levels, right? The amount of glucose in the blood uh, because ins that's what insulin's job is. It's supposed to be there to help to increase the absorption of glucose. So if you remember, the plasma membrane is this very great, efficient barrier between the inside and outside of the cells. And large things like glucose uh, cannot easily pass through the membranes, um, the space between the phospholipids. And so we need a transport protein. We need a carrier protein that's going to allow glucose to come in basically one glucose molecule at a time. Now, uh, in order for those um, proteins to exist, like some of them might naturally exist in some cells. Your muscle cells will have them. Your liver cells will have them. But uh, when your blood glucose levels are really high, you're going to need more of them because you've got really high levels of glucose in the blood. You don't want to leave it there for long periods of time because it's going to affect where water starts to move into your body. All right, water will move into the blood, which is going to cause a whole bunch of problems moving into the, the hypertonic solution in the blood, right? So you want to regulate it. You want to be able to get your blood glucose levels back to a normal level, which is appropriate. To do that, um, you're going to have to add more glucose transport proteins. And that's what insulin does. It goes in, attaches itself to different cells, liver cells and muscle cells, and gets their nucleus to make more of these transport proteins. Now, if you're type 1 diabetes, there could be an issue with the production of insulin in general. So type 1 diabetes, um, you may have no insulin or you make, you make you're either because of a genetic condition, uh, you're something wrong with your cells and your pancreas that make the insulin. And so you either don't make insulin at all or the insulin you make doesn't function well inside of your body or you might make very little insulin. So that means you're gonna be insulin dependent. So you're gonna have to inject insulin directly into your body, all right? You're gonna have to take a little syringe of liquid insulin, right? And uh, measure how much blood glucose you have in your body uh, after you eat. Normally it's done after you eat. Um, and then you're gonna add a little bit of insulin based on a kind of an algorithm, how much insulin you should have versus what your blood glucose levels are and what you want them to be. Uh, and there's like a little chart and diagram that you can use to like figure that out if you're diabetic. Uh, and then you inject that insulin into your body. It slowly moves through your tissue into your blood, going down concentration gradient, right? And then it starts to do its job, right? You also could be type two diabetes, where type two diabetes means um, that excessive strain on your pancreas has caused that, that they no longer uh, produce insulin in efficient levels. So you, most of the time with type 2 diabetes, it's not genetic, it's, it has to do with your diet. So you did produce insulin perfectly fine at one point in your life, but 
normally environmental strain has made the insulin that's produced by your pancreas either not effective or strain on the pancreatic cells themselves have made them degrade and so they're not going to be able to produce as much insulin as you need. Uh, depending on how bad the condition is, type 2 diabetes might need to inject insulin, but in other instances they might just need to take um, different medications, different pills every once in a while uh, to just help support the um, pancreas that isn't functioning as well. So in both instances, it's about keeping the blood glucose levels regulated using insulin levels, but with type 1, normally it is connected to genetics, where type 2 is more often connected to your diet and your um, exercise routine. Uh, technically, um, anyone uh, under the right circumstances could become a type 2 diabetic if you know if they were born perfectly have fine and they don't have diabetes um, they could become type 2 diabetic uh, for through bad nutrition um, and malnutrition and poor exercise routines and that's the really sad thing about diabetes is that it it affects so many different systems because it really what it's doing is it's affecting your ability to absorb blood uh, so I absorb glucose from the blood and because of the concepts of osmosis all right and how water moves into higher concentration areas of higher concentration of solutes it drives the or drives the movement of water from the tissue into the blood all right because eventually the tissue has a higher concentration of water and the blood has a lower concentration of water and so we have this movement of liquid into the blood through osmosis and that can also lead to a lot of other type of health conditions we can have blurry vision, uh, increased thirst, but then also increased urination. So your kidneys are trying to filter out as much water as possible because you've got all this extra fluid inside of your, inside of your blood vessels. Uh, but then you're also really, really thirsty because other parts of your body are actually being dehydrated because they're losing water as it moves into the blood. This can cause excessive tiredness and illness because you don't have enough energy uh, glucose in your cells and other parts of your body to be used there to maintain your cells. You can have issues with your skin, with your gums, and with your bladder getting infected because your immune system isn't functioning as well because of the excessive glucose levels in the blood. You can get dry, itchy skin, again, because the outer layers of you that are around your blood are losing water as it moves inwards. Um, you can have slow healing uh, and uh, to bruises and to cuts. Because again, your immune system and your recovery, uh, that's going to be built around your energy levels in those cells. And your immune system is built on your white blood cells. And so if we affect your blood and we affect how much glucose is available to other cells, um, that's also going to be um, limited as well. And then we can also have a loss of feeling in the feet and sometimes swelling in the feet as well because there can be a f uh, building up of fluid in the vessels in the feet. Uh, as water moves into the blood vessels, it's not necessarily uh, super efficiently going to be moved from the bottoms of your body upwards, right? There's other systems like the lymphatic system that help move fluid around your body. But if the blood, because of this high concentration of glucose, is kind of pulling in all of this extra water, uh, it can actually pool at the bottom of your feet and the excessive stress and um, uh, from this water pressure can can do things to the sensitivity and the functions of your feet. And worst case scenarios, some people are used to be until we had better uh, medical condition or medical treatments now. But it used to be that people that had really bad diabetes, um, if they weren't able to get their insulin levels regulated or insulin regularly, uh, they might actually lose their feet. They might have to have their feet amputated because of the strain that this would that would put them under. So um, there are factors that can contribute to diabetes. Obviously, the ones that we can control would be your diet, uh, your, your overall weight, uh, bad habits with you know, being too sedimentary, and you have to move around, you have to be active enough, you gotta burn that energy from the food that you eat. But there are things that you can't control. Family history, all right? Genetically, diabetes can also be passed down. Uh, how metabolically active some of your, your cells might be, how, how good your thyroid might be, could also be linked to your genes, and that can also snowball into affecting diabetes. Age, metabolism drops as you get older. So as you get older, uh, you increase the chance that you could become diabetic uh, even if you're you're maintaining a good lifestyle, I've known a few people in my life that were reg fairly healthy, but uh, as they got older, the degrading of their pancreas, not necessarily you know from their poor uh, health 
decisions, but just that's just the way things turned out with with their DNA and then their environmental conditions. But as they got older, uh, they ended up becoming diabetic just because of the degrading of their pancreas cells. And then um, belonging to a high risk population, there are certain uh, genetic groups, certain um, racial groups that are actually seem to be linked uh, to having an increase in certain genes that could lead to diabetes. So uh, it is a serious disease, and so hopefully uh, none of you will ever have to deal with it. Sorry about the alarm. No, hopefully you, none of you will have to deal with it, but it is increasing in occurrence, mostly because of people possibly, in, as the world is developing, not making such great health choices, eating fast food too much, eating processed foods too much, and then the stress of trying to you know, work and make money and, and survive in this world, uh, they're not having enough time to make healthy uh, life choices with their diet or with exercise. So if you are overweight from being overnutriated and you have hypertension and type 2 diabetes, there are a lot of things and the other organs in the body that get affected by these conditions. You can have loss of consciousness, you can have an increased risk of stroke, visually impaired, or uh, uh, either lose your vision entirely in some conditions, uh, some cases if it's very extreme, or just um, have poor eyesight, uh, ends up with extreme thirst, you can grow cataracts or have even um, uh, glaucoma. You could increase uh, bad smelling breath because of issues with you know digestion and the conditions of your mouth. Risk infections because your immune system gets decreased. Increased strain in your heart leading to more heart disease, higher blood pressure we've already talked about. Fatigue or lack of energy because your liver is not processing things as well. Again, your liver is going to be one of the places where insulin is going to be stored if you're a diabetic. You can have gastrointestinal problems. You can have pancreas problems or put more strain on the pancreas. So there's kind of this domino effect that comes with having conditions like this. And so it's not necessarily just one thing uh, when it comes to your body's health. Uh, when we think about these illnesses, it could be a single thing like the insulin not properly working so that you don't necessarily get to absorb the glucose from your blood the proper way. However, this has a domino effect which will lead to other organs in your body not functioning as well. And ultimately, it's those uh, that domino effect which causes the real strain on your body and ultimately could lead to your death. So another example you could be thinking of in terms of nutrition-based illnesses. Uh, if you remember all the way back in topic three, we talked about PKU. We talked about phenylketonuria. Let's say, let's see how much you remember. So you can pause this real quick. Look at the information that's on the slide. And can you answer these questions? All right? Did you do it? All right, so then let's see how much you remember from topic three. So phenylketonuria, or PKU, is a genetic disease. So based on the information that's presented, so let's think about, is this something that is autosomal or sex-linked? So it is, is it on chromosomes 1 to 22, or is it on the X and Y chromosome? So looking at the genetic tree here, the, the infected carrier mother versus the carrier father, the notation where we have a, a dominant R and a recessive R uh, being re um, represented and then also just if you remember it from topic three as well. But you can determine or you can remember that it is autosomal. Specifically, it's chromosome 12. You don't have to know that it's chromosome 12, but it is autosomal. So uh, what is a missense-based mutation? So th this is a missense-based mutation that causes this. So what does that mean? So if you remember, that means that one base in the allele has been replaced with another, right? So there's kind of been a switch base substitution. And as a result of that, a different amino acid is going to be um, produced. And because of that different amino acid, we have a different functioning protein uh, at the end of protein synthesis. So it's because of a single base um, causing a different amino acid, we end up with a different functioning protein or a protein actually that doesn't function is actually really the problem. And then looking at this um, genetic map here, uh, what are the chances that the parents, um, if the both parents are, are um, asymptomatic carriers, means they don't have symptoms, they don't have the disease, they are carriers, that means they have the trait with them, which is this recessive trait, if you've already figured out from this information presented. What's the chance that their child will have it? All right, it's about one in four. All right, so if they're both heterozygotes, you have homozygous dominance, you have two heterozygotes, or a 50% chance you get heterozygotes children, and then a one in four or a 25% chance you would have someone that's homozygous recessive, and therefore they would have the disease. So, mm, pretty good, All right? So then let's go through how PKU is a good demonstration of when we think about how nutrition can be, uh, and genetics uh, can be linked to each other when we think about illness. 
So uh, it is an autosomal recessive disease linked to a, a mutated allele that's been a missense based substitution. But specifically what happens is that the allele that has been mutated is the gene that leads to the production of the phenylalanine hydrolase, hydroxylase. Sorry. Uh, if you remember earlier, we talked about how phenylalanine hydroxylase is important for, tenning, for changing phenylalanine into uh, tyrosine. And so that's the enzyme that does uh, this reaction up here that we already talked about, adding that hydroxyl group. So essentially, if you have this disease, your phenylalanine hydroxylase doesn't work. All right, so you can't produce tyrosine from phenylalanine. So as a result of that, phenylalanine doesn't really get metabolized, uh, and so it tends to build up. And so this is actually a problem. Tyrosine, um, you can get tyrosine um, from your diet. So it, it is a, a non-essential amino acid because you can take your phenylalanine, which is essential, and the excessive, excessive phenylalanine will get converted into tyrosine. So it's not necessarily worried that much about your tyrosine levels, it's your phenylalanine levels. So a normal person, they wouldn't have to worry about their phenylalanine levels getting really high because a lot of the excess of phenylalanine ends up getting created or turned into tyrosine so they can be used you know, as that form. Um, because you don't have a functioning high, um, hydroxylase, this doesn't happen. And the phenylalanine that you're eating in your diet uh, will start to build up inside of these cells because it's not being metabolized. This is going to cause problems with other amino acids related to transport, particularly if this happens in the nervous system, it can lead to malformed um, neurons in improper uh, transporting of, of uh, ions and ion channels inside of the nerves, which leads to basically poor mental development or what we would say mental retardation. So someone might have, be mentally deficient or not have their, their optimum mental abilities if they have PKU, if they don't regulate their, um, their phenylalanine levels. And so this is actually a disease is one of the first things that you get tested for after you are born. Almost immediately after the baby is born, uh, they will do a little heel prick and they will basically take a little uh, sample of blood all right, from the, the heel of a newborn baby, and they will take it through a very quick test that will look at the phenylalanine to phenylalanine tyrosine ratio. And so if they're seeing that the ratio of phenylalanine to tyrosine is, is off and that there's a lot of phenylalanine and very, very little tyrosine at all present in the child, that could be an indicator that that, that child has PKU. Now they could do further genetic tests a little bit later when they have more time, but they immediately need to know if they have PKU because if they're going to stop any, you know, promoting of mental retardation as the child is, as the baby is born, they need to give them special formula that is going to limit their phenylalanine intake. So they have to reduce the amount of phenylalanine in their diet so that they don't have it build up excessively over the course of, of you know their development as a baby so that you know they have they can reach their normal mental abilities and this also means you might have to be giving them medication in order to help them uh, artificially reduce the amount of phenylalanine that's present inside their cells so that it doesn't build up over time so once it has been detected through this through this ratio test the really the, the goal is then to have a st very strict low phenylalanine diet and so phenylalanine is very common in dairies and meats and things are high in protein so we're going to have to have a low protein diet so and also no artificial sweet sweetener aspartame um, is also uh, contains phenylalanine so no dairy no meat uh, we can't use breast milk right we're gonna have to use a non-milk based artificial uh, feeding solution for the baby so that's again why we do it immediately after the baby is born. We don't want to give the baby over to be uh, fed by breast milk, and then that phenylalanine-rich breast milk is going to have a, a negative effect on the development of the baby. And then, of course, we're going to have to give them a good amount of medication uh, because, one, is we're, we're limiting their diet. So not just phenylalanine, but other uh, essential amino acids and vitamins would be limited or would be taken away uh, and possibly limited severely based on this diet. So then we're going to have to give them vitamin supplements so that they can get those nutrients in other forms because they're not going to be able to get them by eating um, dairy and meat. And then, of course, we have to give them some phenylalanine, but we have to not give them too much, right? Because we still need phenylalanine to be a functioning, healthy individual, all right? Uh, if we feel like they might be getting an excessive amount, we might have to give them um, uh, uh, other medication to help them reduce their phenylalanine levels artificially. So again, because there is no genetic cure, or sorry, there's no cure for this disease because it's a genetic disease, uh, they'll also go through some genetic counseling so that they, for, they can plan out how 
um, uh, how they have to live their life, basically, what levels of nutrition are they going to have to regulate so that this disease doesn't really have a negative effect on them. Okay, so just two more things left in this topic. Uh, they're kind of just randomly put in here, but uh, when we talk about health as well with nutrition, we're also looking at fats as, as well. So we've talked about, you know, regulating carbs uh, because or sugar intake with you're dealing with diabetic. We have to also think about regulating the essential and non-essential and conditionally essential amino acids. Uh, but you also have to regulate certain types of fats. And so there are different types of fats. And we've already talked about these back in topic two. You have saturated and you have unsaturated. So saturated means has the maximum number of carbon present, where unsaturated means that they would have at least one double bond, so they don't have the maximum number of carbons present, or not carbons, number of hydrogens present, maximum number of hydrogens. Uh, and then they could be monounsaturated, meaning they have a single double bond, or they could be polyunsaturated, having multiple double bonds. Uh, and then we also have to understand these ideas of omega numbers and whether the unsaturated fats are cis or trans. And so cis and trans have to do with the positioning of the um, hydrogen, uh, the, uh, hydrogen uh, atoms around that uh, double bond. And then omega numbers have to do with where in the chain is the double bond present. So if we look at this first one here, we would say that this is a saturated fat. All right, there are no double bonds present, right? So that means that it's a maximum number of hydrogens, so that would be called saturated. Where the other two would have to be unsaturated. Specifically, we would say that they are monounsaturated, right? Because they only have a single double bond. But if we want to learn more about the cis versus trans and omega numbers, the next one here, we would say that it is a um, omega-7 trans fat. And so trans means that the hydrogens are on opposite sides of the double bond. So you see this kind of shape here, right? So we've got hydrogen on this side and a hydrogen on that side, right? And we'll talk about what this actually means in terms of the stability of these fats when they get close together. But trans means that the hydrogens are on opposite sides. And then the omega number is linked to the carbon that the double bond is placed on. So this is starting at the end of the carbon, at the end of the fat. One, this is carbon one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven is where we have our double bonded to the next carbon. So then that is why we call it the seven omega trans because of that's where in the double, where in the compound the, um, the double bond is. The closer the double bond is to the end of the, um, of the polyunsaturated fat or the monounsaturated fat, uh, typically the more space or the larger the kink is going to be because these kind of cause the, um, the, uh, the, the unsaturated fat to kind of turn a little bit because of the presence of the double bond. Here underneath, this one is a monounsaturated, like we said before. All right, but we're looking at an omega-4 cis trans, cis one. I was that it should be four. Should be, oh yeah, sorry. It is four. Even I got <laughs> confused by the image because this is the. Um, this is the OH group, the carboxylic acid group. So it's on this side. So it's flipped around. You guys see that it's flipped around. So even I got uh, confused when I looked at this image again. Yeah, so it is four. So this is one, two, three, four, right? That's where the double bond is. That's why that's omega number four. And cis is referring to the fact that it's on the same side. So the hydrogens are on both sides of the double bond, right? And so when we think about cis and tran fats, uh, the reason why they're important is because tran fats are actually uh, are better at compacting next to each other, uh, and they can take up uh, less volume uh, and have a higher density. So trans fats are more likely to create solid material or solid fat at room temperature or at our body's temperature. So they're more likely to form plaque inside of our arteries, where cis uh, fats are taking up more space because they have a larger kink or a larger bend in them. And so cysts are harder to get closer together, so they're more likely to stay as a liquid at, um, at colder temperatures. So cis fats are less likely to form fats inside of our arteries because they're not going to stay uh, transition into a solid form. So in addition to understanding the differences between cis and trans fats in terms of health, you also have to be able to identify these uh, just in case they should, it pops up on a test. So why don't you pause it and try naming these guys, right, based on what we just did. All right, you paused it. Good, you did it. So first off, you probably identified that none of these are saturated, right? They all have double bonds. And also none of, none of these are mono 
uh, unsaturated because they all have multiple double bonds. So they're all polyunsaturated. And then we think about uh, cis and trans and the numbers. And so these ones are really, really complicated. But basically, you can just start at the end and then move back towards the carboxylic group. So the first one being polyunsaturated, we have omega-3 and 9 because we have it both number three and nine, we have um, the double bonds, and then both of them are being cis. So we would say it's a polyunsaturated uh, cis omega-3-9 th or omega-3-9 cis uh, fat. You can, you can kind of put them in different orders if you need to in terms of their features. Next one also being polyunsaturated, it is three and seven, right? So here's three and seven, and it is also a cis slash trans, right? So the cyst one comes first and then the trans one um, moving that direction. So you get cis and trans or cis slash trans, right? If you wanted to, or you could say three cis, seven trans fats, right? And then the last one here is polyunsaturated, all right? It is omega four and five. So again, going this direction because they flipped it around on you. Uh, right, here's four and here's five, right? So it's there in the middle. Um, and then we also have cysts, both of them being uh, cyst as well. All right, so these are more complicated than you'll probably see on a test, but just in case, all right, uh, you should be able to identify cis and trans bonds and point out omega numbers and whether or not something is polyunsaturated, unsaturated, uh, mono or monounsaturated, or saturated. Now this last bit, we're gonna talk about cholesterol because when we think about our fats, our, our, tris, our, our cis fats and trans fats and unsaturated and, and, and saturated and polyunsaturated and things like that. We're going to talk about how those contribute to your general health when we talk more about your liver and another topic because your liver is really responsible for the creation of cholesterol based on the fat that you consume. But we think about cholesterol, this will give you just a, a general summary. There is this idea of there being bad cholesterol and being good cholesterol. And it really it comes down to the cholesterol that you eat that uh, could contribute to plaque versus cholesterol that's in your body that you can also eat, you could eat um, uh, that helps actually clean fat out of sections of your body. So your bad cholesterol is called the LDL. And so the LDL is a low density lipo uh, proteins. And lipoproteins are basically balls of fat that are kind of held together by proteins uh, that you form in the liver in order to move lipids around your body through your, your blood. Because your blood is 55% water, lipids don't dissolve in water very well, remember they're nonpolar. So they form these lipoprotein balls to help make it so that they're, it's a little bit easier for them to transport through the blood to get to different parts of the body. So LDL cholesterol, sometimes called bad cholesterol, um, it's there to carry cholesterol to your tissues. And remember, you need cholesterol in your cell membranes. It helps with the fluidity of your cell membranes. If they're not enough cholesterol, they get too rigid uh, at low temperatures. Not enough cholesterol, they get too fluid at high temperatures. So you need the right amount of cholesterol. If you're gonna repair your body, you're gonna have to add new cells. In order to do that, you need to do cell division, make more cell membrane. So you need more cholesterol to fix uh, you know, damage that your body goes through and replace new cells. The problem is, is that the low density cholesterol uh, can start to um, build up in your blood and lead to plaques forming along the sides of your arteries and lead to CHD or carotid heart disease where you have plaque forming in the arteries of your heart that are there to keep your heart beating and that's not good. So you don't wanna have too much of the fats that contribute to LDLs in your diet because as your liver absorbs those fats and starts pumping out, L out the LDLs, if you're not really using them, they're gonna float around in the body and they're gonna start to collect and build up and then ultimately could lead to the formation of plaque. Good cholesterol, this idea of high density lipoproteins, high density lipoproteins actually help remove cholesterol from your arteries. And so as, as they get released by the, the liver and float through your body, um, they, uh, if there's excessive cholesterol maybe stuck to the side of the arteries or floating around in your blood, uh, other LDLs, for example, it can absorb those LDLs into it, creating a, a larger high density lipoprotein. And then those LDLs can be uh, broken down and processed by your liver uh, in order to be stored as fat somewhere else inside of your body. So you have to, you want you know, a good amount, uh, you need both of them essentially because you do need to move cholesterol around your body to different locations, but you need more HDL than you need LDLs. If you've got 
uh, a lot, or a good amount of HDL, you can help remove excessive LDLs that you've that you've produced through your diet. And so you really have to try to regulate the types of fats that you're eating that would be contributing to your LDL levels and then your uh, liver's ability to create your HDL or have high density lipoproteins. And so. Uh, and then other factors that would be contributing to things like coronary heart disease besides your diet, uh, smoking, whether you're diabetic, you're obese, which comes to your heart strain, uh, your physical activity, uh, your age, your gender, stress, family history, genetics, all that stuff um, can all be factors as well. So it's not just your diet. There's a culmination of things that are, are going to lead to um, you possibly getting uh, coronary heart disease. Okay, and then the last one, they just want to, again, remind you and emphasize this concept of dietary fiber. Remember, fiber is technically not a nutrition because you don't really absorb it and assimilate it, right? It just moves through your digestive system, but it is an essential part of your diet because fiber, even though it's not going to be absorbed, it's going to help with the process of peristalsis contractions. And so as food is moving through the curves and folds of your small intestine and your large intestine, material can get stuck. And uh, if it gets stuck there and it's kind of De, uh, uh, being decomposed and it's breaking it's being digested but then also maybe some bacteria that you might have consumed start to decompose they can start to build up pressure and heat and that actually can increase the probability that through pressure and heat on certain parts of your digestive system it you know might have to repair itself more actively and so then it starts to lead to more mutations and ultimately leading to cancer so dietary fiber can help reduce the um, collection uh, or the chance of you getting colon cancer or some type of cancer in your digestive system by helping with the movement of undigested material uh, through your body and digested material through your body so that your digestive system and your peristaltic contractions are relatively uh, convenient. Uh, also, fiber, it doesn't really affect your overall nutrition levels because you don't digest it and absorb it, but it can, you know, expand in your stomach, fill up your stomach and make you feel kind of full. All right. So, you know, you can eat a, if you're going to eat a, a smaller meal, right, you add a salad to it. So most of that salad, a healthy salad, right, um, is going to help fill up your stomach, but it's not really actually going to uh, influence your blood and fat and protein levels. So, you know, it's maybe a little bit easier to control what you're eating by using uh, things that are high in fiber to help um, fill you up, but not, not necessarily add weight to you. Okay, so it's, and it's also, fiber can help with the regulation of blood uh, sugar levels and glucose levels by helping, or not glucose, uh, um, cholesterol levels by blocking the uptake of these in your diet. All right, so fiber can also get in the way. Uh, and so as this material moves through your digestive system, if you're not trying to get as much fat and um, sugar in your, in your body as possible, right, if you're on a diet, it can uh, limit how much of it you actually absorb by pushing that material through your small intestine efficiently, so maybe it doesn't necessarily get a chance to be absorbed. Uh, okay, uh, that is it for this point, and if you have any questions, let me know.